Uh, I'm going to tell you about some of the work that we've been doing over the last five or six years um, to try and understand the genetics of late onset Alzheimer's disease and uh, what it tells us about the mechanisms uh, underlying disease. All right, so just a very, there's a quick number, uh, a couple of slides to introduce. So uh, Alzheimer's disease is obviously uh, an adult onset disorder characterized by uh, progressive memory impairment and loss of executive function over a number of years, uh, often as many 10, uh, uh, 10 years uh, for duration of disease. Uh, and it's uh, characterized by massive neuronal loss in the cerebral cortex and gliosis, and you can see um, in the post-mortem brain there, but just how massive that, that uh, cell loss is, that you can see completely shrunken uh, cortex on the right from the Alzheimer patient with massive cells there and large ventricles and basically no hippocampus left. Um, when you look at a, a microscopic level, in addition to the gliosis and neuronal loss, you see this uh, massive accumulation of extracellular amyloid plaques and intracellular uh, neurofibrillary tangles, which are, are composed of tau. And you can see the, the images here in A and B uh, show you the amyloid plaques and tangles. And these are actually from uh, our Alzheimer's paper uh, back in the uh, early 20th century. Um, and those are commonly what people think of when they think of Alzheimer's disease. But if you look at the bottom right, this is another drawing from Alzheimer's paper uh, here, or sort of a, a, show, a figure showing accumulation of lipid uh, within the microglia or around the plaques. And because of modern staining methods and the fact that you uh, obviously will dissolve all the lipids, this is really largely being ignored. But um, as, as you will see with the genetics as we go on, this is actually probably something uh, that is really important to the disease that has been ignored for 50 years at least. Um, so the other thing to say about uh, late onset Alzheimer's disease is that obviously there are often comorbid, comorbid pathologies, uh, particularly vascular pathology, Lewy bodies, and TDP43 inclusions. And so these are Lewy bodies are characteristic of Parkinson's disease, TDP43 characteristic of ALS. And so in the very old, it's not uncommon to see um, multiple pathologies present uh, in the brain. So uh, it's obviously a very, very common uh, disorder. Uh, one in three seniors dies with dementia and it's the only top 10 cause of death in the US that has no, that can't be prevented or cured. So it's a really uh, important public health uh, problem. Currently there are about 5 million people with Alzheimer's disease and because the population is aging uh, by 2050 this will be 3.8 million people uh, and this will be a cost to the treasury of one trillion dollars. Uh, so a really important problem that needs a, a, a solution. So as I said, we, we use genetics to try and um, understand the, the mechanisms underlying disease. And, and this is, a, I think, a sort of nice um, figure to depict the genetic architecture of human disease. And just to orient you, the x-axis has allele frequency in the general population, in the, in the population, and the y-axis has the effect size that, so, up in the uh, top left hand corner you have very rare alleles in the population that have a high impact and that would be uh, um, APP and presenilin mutations that lead to autosomal dominant forms of Alzheimer's disease. On the top right you have high effect common variants 
an APOE, APOE4, APOE2 would be examples of common variants of uh, high effect. Particularly if you have two E4 alleles, your risk is about 15-fold that of somebody who has a 3-3 genotype. And so these are the, the, uh, the genetic variants that we've known about actually since the 90s. Uh, and, and then the rest of the genetics has really been much less understood until the last 10 years. And so on the bottom right, the common variants can be detected with genome-wide associations, these SNP arrays that you can genotype in tens of thousands of people. And then the rare and low free frequency variants have more recently been studied by using whole genome and whole exome sequencing. So the early studies that I mentioned in the 90s studying the Mendelian fa uh, families that identified mutations in APP and presenilin and the uh, common variant association for APOE led to the development of this hypothesis called the amyloid cascade hypothesis that essentially says that, um, that, that all of the disease processes uh, and result from an impairment in, in amyloid production or clearance and that for APP mutations, the, uh, you have um, generally an overproduction of A-beta-42, and in the case of Down syndrome with trisomy 21, you have an overproduction of A-beta. And that those drive this process here of aggregation of A-beta, which uh, is toxic and leads to uh, the tau phosphorylation and aggregation and synaptic damage and ultimately dementia. Uh, and the way that APOE is, so APOE doesn't change the production of A-beta, but uh, Joe Castellano actually in his PhD showed that APOE genotype influences uh, A-beta clearance uh, in the brain and, that, and that, uh, that difference in clearance likely leads to increased uh, aggregation. And indeed in APOE4 carriers, you generally see more amyloid plaques than you would in non-E4 carriers. And so uh, this obviously then led to the development of anti-amyloid therapies, which uh, have all been worked very nicely in the mouse models, and then nothing has worked so far in humans. And so really, this is kind of where we are today, that the uh, base and, and gamma secretase inhibitors of A-beta production all failed um, with uh, side effects and, and uh, a lack of efficacy, at least in changing dementia. Uh, and similarly, all the immunotherapies that have been tried have also had some efficacy in clearing amyloid, but not efficacy uh, in consistently uh, preventing the de uh, decline in, in um, cognition and, and uh, appearance of dementia. So, this is really sort of highlighted that there's really there's clearly gaps in our knowledge, uh, and and that uh, going looking at the other forms of late onset Alzheimer's disease not driven by these particular genotypes might shed light on the other pathways that might be involved and that could be um, targeted from a therapeutic perspective independent of this amyloid cascade hypothesis. So the first success in, in this line actually came from some analysis of, of um, sequence data uh, back in 2013 uh, and two groups, uh, our group working with John Hardy and the DECODE group uh, published back to back in New England Journal reporting rare variants from sequence analysis uh, in this TREM2 uh, protein. Uh, and as you can see at the bottom there, there, there are two, two, meter, two variants which have been consistently shown both in these studies and many subsequent studies, R47H and R62H, so two missense mutations 
that are associated with a, around a two to three fold increase in risk for Alzheimer's disease. So similar in effect size to one copy of APOE4, but this variant is much rarer, maybe half a percent uh, uh, in the population. And interestingly, previously, loss of function uh, alleles, uh, mutations in, in TREM2 have been associated with uh, a leukodystrophy called Nasahakola disease. Uh, disease. Uh, and this uh, disease is actually associated with dementia, but more frontotemporal dementia and uh, no amyloid plaques. So uh, it, it was clearly uh, required for normal brain function uh, but loss of it leads to something different to Alzheimer's disease. So TREM2 uh, is part of the Ig super family of receptors that are expressed in macrophages and uh, throughout the body and in microglia in the brain. Uh, it associates with a signaling adapter protein called Tyra BP or DAP12. And so the signaling is through, uh, th uh, through that protein uh, to uh, and phosphorylation of, of sick. Activation of TREM2 signaling uh, promotes cell survival, phagocytosis, uh, in cytokine production, and uh, uh, changes rearrangement of the cytoskeleton. So sort of pro-phagocytosis um, uh, uh, changes after induction uh, uh, of TREM2. And, uh, and so when people start, so this is some work from um, Marco Colonna and Dave Holtzman uh, at WashU, and Marco's lab demonstrated that uh, TREM2 release senses lipids that are exposed after membrane damage. So that the ligands are a number of different uh, lipids. Uh, it's also a receptor for APOE, which kind of makes sense in that APOE, it, um, so APOE containing lipoproteins, and so I, you know, the fact that it's sensing lipids, that, that may make sense. There's been some uh, literature that says that it's also a receptor for A-beta, but A-beta is a very hydrophobic protein, and it's also likely to bound, be bound to lipid or to damaged membranes, and so the specificity of APOE and A-beta, I think, are, are less clear with rather, so not the proteins themselves, but the lipids they're bound to that are probably the ligands. Um, the AD risk variants that I mentioned, those two variants appear to be partial loss of function. Uh, and when you cross uh, the, the trend to knockout mouse, to 5XFAD, which is one of the more established amyloid de depositing mice, you see a reduction uh, in the number of microglia around the plaque uh, in, in these mice when you've got lower levels of, of TREM2, and that it changes the structure of the amyloid in the plaque to be uh, more fuse and diffuse and likely more toxic in that you get more neuritic pathology around the plaque when you have uh, no TREM2 or less TREM2 present uh, in, in the model. Uh, and this gives us uh, from their paper here showing uh, some of the, the data. So here the um, plaques are in green and the red uh, shows the microglia. And you can see that um, in the TREM2 knockouts on the far right, and, not, and not, so it's wild type on the left, heterozygous for TREM2 in the middle, and knockout of TREM2 on the right, and all of them are on the 5X FAD background. Uh, and you can see that there are fewer microglia around the plaques. In the, uh, in the right hand panels compared to the uh, panels to the left and that's quantified uh, in these little graphs here for a hippocampus and, and for cortex where you can see the X34 or the white bars, no difference in the amount of amyloid in any of these genotypes but the number of IBA1 stained uh, microglia uh, goes down around the plaques 
uh, in both brain areas, uh, and it shows a dose-dependent effect. Okay, so that was really the first evidence, I would say, of a genetic link between, uh, between microglia, microglial function, and risk for Alzheimer's disease. So now I'm going to go uh, on and show you uh, data from mainly from GWAS studies over the last five years or so that have demonstrated that not only do rare variants uh, act uh, in microglia, but that majority of the common variants do as well. So this is a, a meta-analysis showing of GWAS. This is GWAS data from, as you can see, four different studies. Uh, they overlap um, in, in the participants in those studies, but each of the colors in, the, in this Manhattan plot represents whether or not there was a, a significant signal in each of these, in, uh, these data sets. And, and as you can see, so there are 40 loci in total recognized by, across these four studies. Uh, APOE is by far the most uh, um, significant uh, with a p-value of 10 to the minus 160. Uh, but you can see that there are even these other, there are others that are very, very significant below minus uh, uh, 10 to the minus 25. And, 40 that are less than 10 to the minus eight. So, so this is, I would, this represent, this is about 100,000 uh, 100, people in these, uh, 100,000 people that are cases and controls. And then in the Marioni, Kunkel and Janssen, they use uh, proxy cases and controls from the UK Biobank. Uh, but the data seems to be consistent whether or not you're using cases and controls or using the proxy. Uh, symbols. So one of the challenges now then has been that uh, what these GWAS do is identify loci, not genes. And so how do we get some biological meaning beyond the, this uh, observation of, of multiple loci carrying risk for disease? So this is an example here that shows you that you know, when you zoom in on a one, any one of those signals from the previous slide, what you see is there are multiple genes under, this, um, under the association signal, and you don't know which of those genes uh, is important. So the first kinds of analyses that people did was to just aggregate all of the um, significant SNPs under each of those loci and all of the genes. So take, even if we don't know which gene and ask, uh, which pathways are implicated if you look at, if you do that. And the, you can see from those analyses, and this has been pretty consistent across a, a lot of different studies, that immune response, regulation of endocytosis, and cholesterol transport, or meta cholesterol metabolism, are the most um, significant pathways that come out of that kind of analysis. So it's very crude because as I just showed you, there can be 10 genes under a, sim a signal, and we don't know which of those are actually the real signal. But uh, nevertheless, there's been a pretty, pretty consistent observation of these particular pathways be being involved. So even though that was pretty successful, um, early studies trying to connect any one gene to AD risk, basically found that we really couldn't find any evidence of gene expression changes in the brain that were associated with the AD risk SNPs. And so uh, th this was puzzling, obviously, because it's clearly a neurodegenerative disease, uh, and yet we couldn't pick up signals in, in bulk brain uh, RNA-seq or uh, microarray data. Uh, and this, in, in this study from Tofik, when he was a, a postdoc with Phil De Jaeger, I think was one of the first to really give us some insight into why this might be the case. So here, uh, Tofik took a, a large number of, uh, of, of GWAS across different diseases, and he used the epigenetic uh, annotations 
for monocytes and T cells and asked whether the GWAS signals for these different diseases were enriched either in monocytes or in T cells or whether they might be shared across them. And as you can see uh, at the top here, Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease are highly enriched. Uh, their risk alleles are highly enriched within monocytes, but not in T cells. And so this was the first indication that um, maybe uh, we were looking at the wrong, uh, wrong, uh, the, the wrong cell types uh, or not able to detect the right cell types uh, in these bulk uh, microarray uh, analyses. So this is, um, so obviously what Tufik was doing an immune study and so he was only looking at two cell types. Uh, when we moved to Mount Sinai, one of the things that uh, Eduardo Marcora did was to take all of the, the roadmap data for epigenetic uh, annotations across all cell types uh, that were in the database, which is about 220 different cell types. Uh, the CNS cell types, this is all unfortunately from bulk RNA-seq because at the time there are all microarray data because there wasn't any um, single cell data. But what you can see, so this is now looking just at AD risk variants. And this is the uh, line of horizontal line shows that the things that are significant. And what you can see again is that the epigenetic elements associated with these immune cell types uh, are highly enriched for AD risk variants, but none of the brain bulk tissue showed any signal. And this is consistent with what we had been seeing even five years earlier than that. Uh, there is a signal in liver, but other cell types uh, don't show up. So this was another demonstration that something about myeloid cells in particular was that they seem to be enriched for uh, AD risk. And then this is sort of taking this, this um, a step further. Gloria Novakova, who's a graduate student in the lab, uh, used data that allowed her to break up those epigenetic annotations to be able to look at uh, active enhancers, active promoters, primed enhancers, and primed promoters. And we did this using epigenetic data from monocytes, macrophages, and now microglia. And we're able to show that the AD risk alleles are highly enriched and consistently enriched in the active enhancers across these three different myeloid cell types. So monocytes, macrophages, and microglia have somewhat similar uh, enrichments in all, all three cell types. So Encouraging in that obviously microglia seem like the more likely biological, physiological uh, cell type to be important. But it also it told us that we could use macrophage data sets and monocyte data sets as really good proxies because they seem to be similarly enriched for these AD risk alleles. Uh, and the gray bars, so the red bars are all Alzheimer's disease and the gray bars are schizophrenia. Uh, PGC GWAS, uh, and you can see there's no association with any of those uh, epigenetic annotations uh, in any of the cell types for schizophrenia. And that's consistent with data in the literature where the GWAS for schizophrenia is much more enriched within neurons. On the bottom, we have a similar kind of enrichment analysis using LD score regression. But now we're looking at different transcription factor binding motifs and across these different uh, cell types. And the most consistent observation is that PU.1 uh, transcription factor binding motif is enriched for AD risk alleles in all three cell types. As you can see, there are some other uh, transcription factor binding motifs that show up. Uh, but, and they differ from different cell types, with, with the exception of PU.1, which shows up significantly in all, in all three cell types. 
So this is some data from Chris Glass's lab that came out recently uh, doing a, a uh, so he, he basically, he generated epigenetic data across microglia, neurons, oligodendrocytes, and astrocytes from human brain tissue, uh, and then looked across a lot of different neurologic and psychiatric diseases. And I just want you to focus on the left-hand side of the panel here, where you can see two AD data sets, and again, enriched. So the yellow is in, or yellowy green is enhancer, and bluey green is promoter. And as with uh, glorious data, this data uh, shows there's an enrichment of AD risk alleles specifically in microglial enhancers. And you can see that there is no enrichment of, uh, that, that compares in any other cell type. So Alzheimer's disease really seems to be a, uh, a gen genetically uh, a disease of microglial dysfunction. So putting those things together then, we are obviously looking for DNA sequence variants that are going to be occurring in enhancers. And those enhancers can be regulating genes that are at some distance away from them. So that means that, oops, sorry, why it's doing that, uh, that the enhancer will be in that GWAS signal, underneath the signal but the gene doesn't have to be. So if you just focus your analysis on the genes that are immediately under the 10 to the minus eight uh, signal, you might actually be missing the right gene because the enhancer can be under the signal, but the gene itself may be at some distance away. So, and obviously we know from the, the studies I just showed you that we are, we are focusing on uh, enhances in specifically in microglia. Okay, so we know they're enriched in active enhancers. How do we identify the genes that are that these enhancers are regulating? Uh, and so the way that we uh, so the first thing that we did actually was uh, was sort of to integrate GWAS and expression data was focused on this region that you've already seen that was previously called the self one locus. Um, and what we did here was to take expression data from um, monocytes and from macrophages and to identify SNPs or uh, DNA variants that, that uh, control the level of expression uh, of that gene and then to integrate that with the ADGWAS data uh, in a way that you can, in a, using Mendelian randomization that allows you to test whether the, the variant that's causal for variation in gene expression is also the, uh, responsible for the difference in disease risk. And we did this now uh, three years ago, focused on this particular locus this was published in Nature Neuroscience in 2017. So uh, this was some work done by uh, Quan Lin Wang, a graduate student in the lab at the time. And this uh, shows the data from monocytes on the left and macrophages on the right, where you can see that this particular polymorphism has uh, an, a genotype dependent effect on expression of this gene, which is SPI1. Um, in both monocytes and macrophages. And if I go back to this slide, you can see SPI1 is here, and there are many, many other genes in this region. The only other gene that showed any level of association in the same kinds of analysis was this MYBPC3, but this is really not expressed uh, at very high levels in microglia. And, and uh, so SPI1, seemed like a strong candidate because SPI1 is the gene that codes for PU.1, the transcription factor that I showed you had a binding motif that is highly enriched for AD risk alleles. Okay. So uh, this is some uh, work from Anna Pimanova, a, uh, a postdoc in the lab um, who has 
So based on that uh, genetic observation, we have a modulated expression of SPI1 in BV2 cells, which are mouse microglia-like cells. And so you can see that uh, knockdown of SPI1 in blue and overexpression in orange. And then we tested, and she tested a number of other genes, including several AD risk loci. And what we were able to see was that these, these genes, their expression was modulated by modulating SPI1 expression. So in the case of the MS4A genes, their expression goes up when P.1 goes up and goes down when P.1 goes down, whereas at the end, APOE and clustering, they go the opposite way. They go down when, when, APOE, uh, when uh, uh, P.1 is up and down, uh, sorry, and up when P.1 uh, is uh, down. So this was uh, evidence that then that this modulation of the level of expression of this transcription factor uh, that is associated with AD risk actually modulates the expression of other AD risk, uh, AD risk genes. So it's the first time that we really identified a network of genes that were both AD, uh, that were AD risk factors and clearly within the same network with themselves. So that was just looking at one locus. Uh, and so now we've expanded those analyses in a couple of different ways. And uh, the first one I'm gonna show you that the analyses have been led by, um, by Gloria Novakova in the lab. And this is the work that has, uh, has gone from linking enhancers to gene expression and then from gene expression to disease risk here. So you can see that it's integrating a lot of different types of data, GWAS data, EQTL data, chromatin interaction data from HI-C, uh, HQTL, so chromatin QTLs or histone QTLs, and then using this uh, Mendelian randomization uh, methodology to causally relate the variance in the enhancers to variability in gene expression, and then to link variability in gene expression to disease risk. Okay, so this is, I, I'm gonna show you a couple of examples of, that, of this work, and then a summary slide that shows the, the overall genome-wide data. So here you can see, this is the ADGWAS signal on, oh dear, on chromosome two. And you can see that in the same region of the chromosome, there is a, a mono, a, an expression QTL in monocytes for this gene BIN1 that's shown here in red, and you can see the direction of transcription. If you look in, in other data sets, you can, there are active enhancers in monocytes at these two points here one within the BIN1 locus, one just upstream. And then you can see from the high C data that there are chromatin loops here that link these two active enhancers. And that uh, these uh, interactions here are predicted uh, that this, the candidate SNP uh, here within this uh, enhancer uh, is likely to modify uh, these chromatin, uh, the, these loops that are captured by the high c data in the monocytes. And this is actually data from Chris Glunz's lab published uh, just at the end of last year that uh, took a slightly different approach but came to uh, very similar conclusions. This is a microglial specific enhancer here. Here is uh, the SNP they were looking at and from the ADGWAS signal. You can see um, a taxic peaks here in microglia, but not in other cell types. Uh, and uh, again, you can see plaxic loops uh, similar to the high C loops that, that we reported, suggesting that there's uh, uh, chromatin contacts in this region, specifically in microglia. And this is particularly important in the case of BIN1 because BIN1 is actually expressed in lots of cell types. 
as you can see, there are uh, there's the bin one promoter is active in most of these all of these cells except astrocytes. And indeed, there's a massive amount of work on bin one and its role in tau uh, pathology because it is expressed in neurons. But indeed, it looks like the genetic association is with a SNP that is within a, a microglia specific enhancer. And uh, what Chris's lab did was to delete the enhancer in iPS cells and then differentiate them, oh goodness, sorry about that, um, differentiate them into microglia neurons and astrocytes. And then on the top, you see RNA expression. On the bottom, uh, you see protein expression. You only see a decrease in the RNA when you delete the, in, when you look in microglia. And similarly, when you look at the protein expression for bin one, you only see a loss of protein expression when you delete this enhancer in the microglia. So it's deleted in all the cells, but you only see the impact of it in microglia. So this is a very clear example that this is a microglial specific enhancer that this uh, AD risk SNP uh, is in. And even though the protein is broadly expressed, it is only having an impact on expression in microglia. So this is a second example. Um, this is an MS4A locus that, um, so Gloria did the omics analysis here, Sarah and uh, Julia and uh, Anastasia have both uh, been doing work on the, um, using the iPS cells to, to evaluate this. So here again, you can see evidence. So here we've got a uh, chip seek in microglia uh, and uh, a tax seek data in microglia. And you can see here that there's this basically what looks like closed chro chromatin here where you've got repression of, of the signal and signal on the either side of this. And the promoter capture high C also identifies here a chromatin loop. Uh, a repressive loop present in monocytes and macrophages. And we, we uh, noticed that, so there are CTCF binding sites at, the, where, where this, uh, at, the, at these sites here. And if you look at, when we looked at the sequence, we found that one of the GWAS signal SNPs is right within the CTCF, CTCF binding motif at this C here, which is clearly an important residue for the binding motif. And so by then looking at people with different genotypes, we were able to show at the bottom here that people with different genotypes for this SNP had different levels of expression of uh, this MS4A, uh, 6A gene, uh, that shows allelic differences in expression. When we've, this is looking at a tax seek reads uh, from the induced microglia from someone who's uh, from heterozygotes. This is looking at brain attack seek data. And we were able to look at the brain attack seek data from bulk data because this gene is only expressed in microglia. So we know the signal is only coming from microglia. So over on the right, we, this is sort of our hypothesis about how this is working that uh, if you have the C allele, you have this CTCF binding uh, here, which creates this repressive loop, uh, and you have low expression levels from the, the MS4A6A gene. When you don't have the, when you have a T allele there, you break this CTCF binding. Uh, so now that the repressive loop uh, is no longer present in the chromatin, and this enhancer can act to increase the level of expression of MS486A. And so we believe that this is likely to be the mechanism. And now as part of her uh, graduate thesis, uh, Anastasia is, has um, created this mutation in, in um, isogenic lines and also deleted the CTCF binding motif so that we can look uh, both at the impact on the, in that cell on uh, expression and show that, that, that it's due to this particular variant, but also look at the, uh, at the impact on the function of the microglia when we change, change that. So that's just two examples. 
but they said this was a genome-wide survey that Gloria did, and so here is a Manhattan plot now, colored in so that you can see, now we've labeled genes because she's identified genes, and the red, uh, the red si signals are where higher expression of that gene is linked to increased risk for AD. And the blue symbols, uh, signals are where the lower expression is linked to uh, increased risk for AD. And then the gold ones are ones where we were able to identify the gene from the enhancer analysis, but we were not, and we haven't yet been able to demonstrate the direction of effect in terms of whether it's uh, higher or lower levels of expression that are increasing risk of the disease. So from that, then we were able to identify about 20 different genes. So at least half, about half of the AD risk loci, we can now identify a specific gene uh, that is likely to be the risk factor and to pinpoint the direction of effect. So now that allows us to do functional studies where we can lower or increase expression of this gene and look at the functional impact of that, uh, knowing which direction is supposed to change risk for disease. So the other uh, observation that came, important observation that came out of this was that when you looked at a pathway enrichment analysis, what we were able to see was that many of these genes identified from the Gloria study were uh, present, uh, were part of the endosomal, uh, endolysosomal pathway specifically. Well, so these genes are involved, obviously, in the endosomal lysosomal pathway in many, many cell types, in all cell types. But the genetic effects are specifically in these genes within microglia that are causing uh, a risk an increase in risk for, for Alzheimer's disease. And so now we are very focused on understanding how these different genes are affected, affecting uh, this endosomal lysosomal uh, system uh, specifically in microglia. So I mentioned that we used a couple of different approaches to try and identify th these genes. And I should say that what Gloria did was to take only the genome-wide significant regions. So she started with 40 regions and about 20 of them she was being able to identify a specific gene. Uh, what uh, Dado and Monaf did here was to broaden their, their search so that they were looking at regions that had um, didn't need to be genome-wide significant that so uh, but they also so they started off in in their initial screen that what they were interested in so they took all protein coding genes uh, in this window and they wanted to identify the EQTLs associated with those genes obviously specifically in, in myeloid cells so what we were looking at was all myeloid cell EQTLs and ADGWAS signals. And if we had evidence from this COLOP pr program, of uh, 80% uh, 0 0.8 uh, posterior uh, probability that the GWAS signal and the EQTL were being driven by the same SNP, uh, the, we then went on to analyze them uh, using uh, different, met different approaches here, metax scan, uh, and SMR, so two, two other regions, uh, two other ways of connecting EQTLs and AD risk genes to identify um, both, again, both the, the presence of SNPs that are regulating disease and gene expression in myeloid cells uh, and the direction of effect that we see. And so this now is, so I, I Apologize, this is the second to last set of slides here, not the final. So this should actually say over 200, there are 260 different signals on this, from this analysis. So now we've gone from 40 risk loci to 260 genes that we think are implicated in Alzheimer's disease. Uh, this is a Miami plot where on the top you've got, these are genes where overexpression is increasing risk for disease. 
And on the bottom, you have a series of genes where lower expression is increasing risk for disease. So again, it's change variability in gene expression, but it doesn't necessarily have to be through an enhancer. Gloria's work was specifically looking uh, for variants in enhancers. In this case, it could be in the promoter or it could be some other way of regulating uh, the level of expression. But you can see we have a lot of different of genes now, over 200 genes uh, identified as risk factors for disease across the genome. So again, if one takes, so here, here's our hairball. Uh, and if you look at the pathways that are enriched within uh, these genes, uh, they are phagocytic pathways uh, that are enriched for Alzheimer's disease. And I have two different um, pathways that come out here that are related. The FCR gamma R mediated phagocytosis on the top from keg pathways and on the bottom microglial pathogen phagocytosis pathways um, from wiki pathways. So again, so phagocytosis obviously uh, involves the endosomal lysosomal system again. So we have two, um, two different approaches that have come up with the same essentially the same pathways enriched uh, in AD risk. And if we sort of summarize that data, what we see, so we still see that in some of these 40 loci, there are multiple genes. So uh, suggests that there really probably are truly more than one gene in some of these loci affecting risk for disease. From a biological perspective, interesting things that we've observed there are multiple gene family members identified across some of these. Um, uh, so OAS 1, 2, and 3, LACT B and LACT B2, and the MS4A cluster we've mentioned before. TREM2 we mentioned before, but in this new analysis, you can see TREM1 and TREM L2 also come out. So clearly gene family members doing, presumably doing similar tasks uh, related tasks uh, all see to carry uh, risk alleles. Some genes that we've identified both rare variants and common variants and so uh, three examples uh, PLC uh, gamma 2, ABCA7 and ABI3 and uh, and the, so last thing, the, so 20 of the 25 genes that were identified in the enhancer analysis were also identified in the EQTL analysis. Uh, and that the direct predicted direction of effect was the same in both analyses. So these seem to be pretty robust. We're finding uh, the same, same genes and SNPs coming out from different approaches. Uh, and as I just showed you on the last slide, the pathways that are enriched seem to point to uh, phagocytosis uh, of these cells. And so this, I think this is the next, yeah, yeah, right. So, so this sort of just summarizes uh, that this data and really demonstrates that, um, so the process of aphrocytosis, which is the engulfment of lipid rich debris which might be myelin fragments, apoplotic neurons, synapses that you want to clear, dystrophic neurites, that, that this is the process that all of these AD risk genes are pointing to. So engulfment of that kind of damage uh, by microglia uh, is, is likely to and that the efficiency of that process and then of the for the microglia of you know, digesting and clearing that, that engulf material, that that is really likely to be the process that is fundamentally dysregulated uh, in these, uh, by these AD risk genes. I'm gonna skip that. So I'm just, I will, in the last few minutes, I'm gonna try and gonna keep it to at least finish at one. Um, I just wanna show you a little bit of functional data has been done on some of these genes to uh, follow up the findings. And so, um, so several years ago now, 2017, uh, Ido Amit's group and a number of others reported uh, that tissue damage in, in, uh, the, in the brain, and it can be from aging or neurodegenerative disease, 
leads to uh, a conversion of um, microglia from their homeostatic state where they're surveying their environment to a um, to what it was termed at that time disease associated microglia but there are other names now damage associated microglia uh, where uh, so lots of things you'll see in the literature we don't seem to have settled on one name anyway the what what distinguishes these dam microglia is that they have a down regulation of homeostatic genes and then an upregulation of lipid metabolism genes and phagocytosis genes. Um, sorry about that. Uh, so that these cells are now able to go to the site of damage and to engulf that damaged material and to uh, degrade it and clear it and recycle it. So, and then the so around the same time that that single cell data came out identifying uh, these subpopulations of microglia, there were um, genetic studies that demonstrated in mouse that both APOE and TREM2, so two important genetic risk factors for Alzheimer's disease, are required for the conversion of these homeostatic microglia to the damage associated microglia. And that if you have a complete knockout of TREM2, you cannot generate uh, a, a dam microglia. You, everything is sort of either in these pre microglia, uh, uh, pre dam cells or homeostatic cells. And similarly with APO, with what you see is there's a massive upregulation of APOE as you convert from homeostatic to dam microglia. And so if you have no APOE, again, you cannot uh, convert. And I just point out to you that one of the uh, genes that uh, helps to define the homeostatic state is the SPI1 gene that we found as, a, as an AD uh, uh, risk gene. Okay, so this is some in vitro data looking both at phagocytosis and inflammatory response in BV2 cells from uh, anapiminova. So again, the model is uh, in the top uh, here is overexpression of, of 2.1 or SPA1, and you can see that that leads to an increase in phagocytosis. And on the bottom, when you uh, use an shRNA to knock down 2.1, you decrease uh, phagocytosis of both myelin and zymosan. And you can see actually these two different substrates have slightly different pictures in that the, the myelin eventually reaches normal uh, levels of phagocytosis. It's just slower to do so, whereas the zymosan, it doesn't at all. So, and then on, on the right, this is an experiment exposing the cells to LPS and asking what happens to uh, the, the uh, inflammatory response uh, when you change the expression of 2.1. And so what you can see here in the overexpression model, that when you add an LPS, there's really uh, potentiates the impact of LPS, that you have much higher levels of expression of all of these genes. Oh dear, sorry. Um, compared to when you have the normal levels of 2.1. And you see the opposite effect in the presence of LPS when you knock down 2.1, that you attenuate uh, this inflammatory response. So we can see that in vitro, we're having an effect on both phagocytosis and on the inflammatory response when we modulate the levels of SPI1 in, in these uh, microglia. So this is some, uh, now some in vivo data. For, this is a, a collaboration with uh, Anne Schaefer and Pina Ayata, a postdoc in her lab. Uh, Pina has made uh, mice where we have uh, knocked out one allele of SPI1 in the uh, adult uh, microglia. Uh, these are also, uh, with the trap mice so that we can also isolate the, the microglia. But in this particular experiment, these uh, mice uh, have been crossed to the 5XFAD mice to examine the impact of 
uh, SPI1 expression in microglia on uh, amyloid plaque, as you, we saw previously with the, the trend two uh, models. So here you can see, um, this is the, the wild type normal levels of SPI1. And on the bottom is where we have one fl uh, flox allele. So they got half as much uh, poo point one. And you can see there appears to be some difference in the structure of the amyloid that we have a more dense plaque here than we do when uh, 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 in the normal levels. Uh, here you can see the microglia and in the merged image, you can see the microglia around the plaque and, and here it's been masked so you can see the DAPI and the number of microglia around the plaque. Uh, and you can see there are more microglia around the plaque and that's quantified here by looking at lots of, uh, of uh, um, images across the, uh, this region of the brain and you can see uh, that. So we're now basically seeing the opposite effect of TREM2, right? So loss of TREM2 is associated with risk for Alzheimer's disease and you have fewer microglia around the plaques. Lower levels of uh, SPI1 is associated with protection from Alzheimer's disease. And here we see that there are more microglia uh, around, around the plaques when you've got less SPI1 expression. So in summary then, Alzheimer's disease is clearly a polygenic disease with many genetic risk factors of low effect, that these risk alleles are enriched in the myeloid enhancers uh, and in 2.1 binding motifs. They are also the gene, once you identify the genes that these enhancers are regulating, they are enriched for uh, endosomal lysosomal pathway genes within microglia. Uh, and they really are implicating this epherocytosis pathway as a causal pathway in Alzheimer's disease. And then uh, just finally, so both, uh, so APOE, TREM2, and the SPI1, clearly regulate the transition from this homeostatic to dam microglia, influencing phagocytosis, inflammatory response, and the A beta plaque structure. And just uh, finally to finish, I hope hopefully I acknowledged most people along, along the way. The genomic studies were originally started by Quan Lin Wang and uh, over the last uh, five years, uh, Dado, Gloria, and Manav have been instrumental in, in moving those studies forward to identify all of these novel genes. Uh, most of the functional data that I showed you in vitro was uh, generated by Anna Pimanova, and the mouse model data I showed you at the end was from Pina Ayata. So, thank you.